open. So you have to be open to communicate your new lifestyle and the way your business now operates. And I think that you need to have a partner to respect that. And you also have to respect their wish. Oh, a huge challenge. And it, it really changed when I, um, when I be- became an entrepreneur and started really, you know, putting my passion out there and explaining what I do and putting myself out there. A lot of, you know, good friends even were not in supportive of it. And now they're no longer friends because that to me, if you can't support someone following their passion, that is not a good friend where before, you know, I had the weekends and we could go do our brunches or whatever lunches. And it was, you know, we talked about whatever it made the theme of the office or whatnot. But now I feel like, you know, your, your friendships change, um, romantic relationships too. your time is um spent differently you always want to be working and it's a good thing because you love what you're doing but you also sacrifice welcome to the pave your paradise podcast i'm mandy ross international media personality speaker writer life cheerleader and coach each episode i'll share a guest or an idea to help you blast through your limiting beliefs nourish your soul and connect with yourself to take your relationships health business, and life to a next level. We don't play small. We're meant for great things. We take our struggles and turn them into slam dunk successes. This is the place for you to create your best you so you can pave your personal path to paradise. Are you with me? Let's do this. Hello and welcome back to the show. Thanks for tuning in to Pave Your Paradise podcast. I feel happy and grateful to have you joining me. If you're new here, I'm Mandy Ross, host of this amazing space for you to level up your relationships, your health, your business, and your life. And I'd love to know how you're feeling today. What's on your heart and mind? Send me what has you feeling stuck and what topics you want me to cover on the podcast and also which episodes you absolutely love. I create these episodes to try and help you and so I'd love your feedback. Please let me know by sharing on your posts and stories and tagging me at Mandy J. Ross and Pave Your Paradise. I feel so excited to share that I started a Patreon page. It's up and I feel thrilled to serve you even more through it. There's lots of additional resources I'll be sharing, so for you to join the official Pave Your Paradise community, where you'll be receiving tons of self-growth, self-love, and self-compassion tips, techniques, and tools for your personal development toolbox, also to connect with me in live group calls and coaching, plus be supporting the podcast and myself to raise awareness on self-love and compassion and connection, please visit my new page at at www.patreon.com slash Mandy J. Ross. And now I feel thrilled to feature a special guest on today's episode. Life and business organizer, speaker, and author Jane Stoller, or Organize Jane to those who know her brand. So many of you have reached out about decluttering your life of things that no longer serve you and making room for all that does. So I'm so happy to bring you a leading expert, not to mention fierce, fearless boss babe on these topics. Plus, y'all know how passionate I am about organization, systems, streamlined living, and anything that helps to create more time for living life fully. Jane Stoller is a Swiss-Canadian life biz organizer, speaker, author, and university instructor whose passion is decluttering spaces and organizing business processes. Jane wrote her first book, Organizing for Your Lifestyle, in 2016 to help friends get more organized. It ultimately gained international attention, and this allowed Jane to turn her passion into a profitable business. Organize Jane. Stoller travels all around the world, working with clients ranging from individuals looking to revamp one space to large corporations needing a complete business overhaul. Prior to launching her organizing business, Stoller worked for the largest cement company in the world, which allowed her to live all over Canada and Europe. Jane had an invaluable experience, but decided to make a nerve-wracking jump to entrepreneurship after realizing she wanted to live life to its fullest and follow her passion for organizing. 
Stoller is currently promoting her second book, Decluttering for Dummies, Teaching, Working with Individuals and Corporate Clients, and can be found at various speaking events. So Jane is an organizer, author, speaker, and founder of Organize Jane, The Brand, and so much more. We connected through social media, and then she invited me to be a speaker at her Women in Business event and book launch. Discovering what she's all about, I knew I had to have her on the show for you. Because of her background and own personal transformational journey of struggle into success, she's full of insight and inspiration. She's someone who I completely appreciate, and I feel such an immense amount of respect for what she's creating in this world, especially on organization, mindset, and helping others create a life that they love. Her strategies and advice are positively impactful, so I had to share her with you. I want to continue bringing on expert guests that will help you, inspire you, and empower you, and Jane Stoller is a breathing, living, walking example of paving your own path to paradise. We dive deep in this episode on her personal journey of turning struggle into success, how to turn your side hustle into an empire, how to live in an organized way that works for you, going against the grain of societal norms, decluttering your mind, how to have a successful relationship, including how to navigate dating and relationships as a busy entrepreneur, living authentically, unapologetically, and creating your own path to freedom, and so many other inspiring topics. So I hope you all enjoy this interview as much as I did with Jane Stoller. All right, Jane Stoller, aka Miss Organized Jane on Instagram and elsewhere, Life Biz Organizer. Thank you so much for joining me on Pave Your Paradise podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to have you sharing all of your expertise on organization with the audience today. And What I always ask anyone who comes on first is what was the first thing you did when you woke up this morning? (laughs) The first thing I do when I wake up is actually make my bed. I've accomplished something. I do it right away. And then I head straight to my closet, which is always laser focused and ready. And my clothes are laid out. So that's what I do. It's very boring. Oh, my goodness, girl. That's very (laughs) A-type. Actually, it's funny. I've actually heard studies that say that people who make their beds first thing in the morning and every day as a routine, they actually end up being more successful. Now, I don't want you to be biased, <laughs> but what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I didn't actually think about it until I read um, one of Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Work Week, where he talks a lot about accomplishing small goals throughout the day. And it makes sense because you get up, you make your bed, and then it's something you've accomplished and you can move on to the next task. So I agree with it. Aside from work, Jane, and having your organized bed making and clothes laid out, (laughs) what gets you up in the morning? So I like to incorporate a bit of movement into my day. Um, I try to exercise or at least sweat every day. And if I can, I do this first thing in the morning before I, you know, I've gotten ready for the day. So for myself, it's a way to kind of just before I check my phone or my Instagram or my emails, I do whatever it is. I go for a quick run. I meet my friends at the gym. I do a workout on my app, something to get me moving. Amazing. I love movement. <laughs> it's one of my apps. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, girl. You know it. And mm-hmm. what has been a highlight of your week so far? I know you're in the Bahamas right now. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And I also have a love for that area of the world. <laughs> but what has been a highlight of your week so far? Yeah, I've, I've taken really um, a business break. I but uh, Let's say I've had 2019 has been an intense year, as I'm sure for a lot of us, yourself included, and listeners, you know, we're always, you know, especially entrepreneurs, we're always working, you know, more than the eight hour days. So I really needed to take a break. So the highlight of my week this week has actually been putting a post on Instagram, letting everybody know that I'm taking a business break. I'm following my own advice and I'm getting laser focused. I need to recharge. I have to, in 2019, focus on my big priorities. And I had such a great response. So many DMs saying, you know, you deserve a break and that's great. And I can't wait to see what you're working on. So being authentic and telling people, you know, you are taking a break and having people value that, that was kind of one of my um, highlights of the week. Oh, I love that. And you're absolutely right. It's just that ability to, I say, work hard, relax harder. (laughs) 
Mm -hmm. I like that. (laughs) And it's true, right? Like you need to recharge even the most ambitious and accomplished individuals. You always need some, something and somewhere to recharge. Exactly. For those of the audience listening out there, for those people who may not be familiar with you and your background and what led you to become who you are today as Organized Jane, would you mind please sharing a bit about yourself and your journey that led you to today? Today, the transformational process, and also, you know, what you're very excited about right now that you have going on. So it's a great question because it's very difficult being organized, Jane, because everybody always wants to look in my purse and my closet and, you know, my desk to make sure it's organized. But um, I do love that, and I strive to organize and help people get their lives and businesses, even everything from processes to digital organization. And I do it for, for, um, you know, you have to organize for yourself. It doesn't have to look perfect. So for myself, I have loved organizing things and processes since I was about six years old when I first remember it. And I've just always helped people do this. And from my family to my friends, to my teachers, to and when I worked in the corporate world for 10 years, I was always organizing. And I tried to start this business um, 10 years ago and I failed. It was, you know, I was, I was too nervous to market myself and market this so-called fluffy business I thought it was. And I continued working for a large cement company for 10 years, gained so much experience, and again, was continually organizing mostly business processes, businesses, and also my colleagues would always seek advice. So I was still organizing people and things and processes, but not in my own business per se. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then two years ago, I made the kind of nerve-wracking jump again to entrepreneurship, and this time I knew that the first time I failed because I was scared to market myself and I, you know, hired a business coach and I got over that fear and said, I am put on this earth to help people get organized. And that is a skill I cannot devalue. And Mm -hmm. for two years now I've been organized Jane and it's, um, it's been going strong. Oh, Jane, thank you so much. First off for sharing your story. Cause I think there's so many nuggets of wisdom within that, that, I can extract and I have so many questions, but I mean, my first question is just how did you, because I think this is something people struggle with so often. So many people that I speak with on this podcast, it's like that revelation within where you finally get to a point where you're so tired of not living in your truth, Mm -hmm. not living in your divine, you know, direction, your divine purpose that God in the universe has, has created for you. Like, how did you finally get to that point where you're like, you know what, I can't go one more day not doing what I am meant to do on this planet? Like, how did you go through that process? You know, it's a really good question. And I think um, it was, it took some time to really get to it. But I remember the day because I had been working in my corporate world. I was, you know, I had moved, they'd moved me all over Canada and I was always willing and a hard worker and, and was, um, you know, from Vancouver to Edmonton to, <laughs> to, you know, Nanaimo, BC. And then I moved to Europe for the company and then in Switzerland And I remember going home each day after work and I traveled a lot with them and I was tired of always traveling. And then, you know, I'd get home and I'd be too tired to really do anything but watch TV. And I thought, this is not helping people. I'm not, you know, I'm not serving my purpose. And then they, the next day I went to work and they said, okay, we need to move you to France in Lyon, a small town. And I was so tired and I said, I don't want to move anymore. I want to create my own path. And I know that I can help more people if I can create my own company and, you know, my own vision instead of, you know, you know, people I was helping at work, but in a different capacity. So it was that very moment that they said, we're moving you again, that I said, no, I'm not doing that. And so what actionable step did you take after you made that decision? Yeah, it was, you know what, I don't, sometimes I don't advise that you should probably have a plan in place, but I said, no, I'm not moving. And they said, okay, then you won't have a job anymore. So at that point, it was almost like a trigger that I had to move quickly. Mm -hmm. And I immediately started going online to find a tribe of mentors and resources. And that's where I found my business coach, because I knew if I didn't have that, I wouldn't succeed. So it was kind of almost I needed a push. Mm -hmm. And that push led me to looking for mentors. And that's what I think I didn't have the first time around either. Now we have so many men and women that are online, offline that we can go to for support. 
which 10 years ago, I didn't look for that. And it wasn't as accessible as it is today. And so you got the coach. Did you like, I'm so curious, did you end up leaving that position or did you do the, the kind of transitory where you stayed with them and then you worked towards your goal as a side hustle? Yep. No, as soon as I said I wasn't moving, they said, okay, then there's no more job because they were closing the office in Switzerland. So it really was, I moved back to Canada with no job. Uh, mm-hmm. And I said, you know, what, I'm going to make this work. And immediately started telling my contacts what I was doing. And I didn't have a website. I didn't have content. I had nothing. I just had business coach and, that I was working with. And immediately getting confidence every day. To, she was like, you need to tell people what you're doing. You have to ask for it. You have to not be scared to market that, right? So I started to do that. And then momentum started to come after that. And did you land clients right away? Like what was giving you that, you know, you said that you build your confidence day after day. Like, was it that you like initially, did you get some clients and that made you feel more confident? Like what was that kind of juice inside of you that was flowing? Oh, it's a great question. Because I remember um, I was even scared to post on LinkedIn. I was scared to post on Instagram. And as soon as I did, I remember after working with my coach, she's like, put a post out there and say what you're doing. And it was an Instagram post. And it was vulnerable and saying, you know what, I've left my corporate job, I'm going to be pursuing helping businesses and people get organized. And immediately, I had a few people contacting me about one was a financial services business in Ottawa about some restructuring. One was about personal organizing. And I thought, wow, one post and two people have contacted me. So it was really that people coming to me when I was just sharing my story. And that gave me the momentum to keep going. I love that you said that because, you know, with what I do as well as a coach in a different way, mm-hmm. I can see and I see it too on social media so often the power of sharing your story mm-hmm. and the fact that people can connect with you. If you don't tell people what you're doing, there's no way that anyone will ever be able exactly. to tap into that. And that's the thing like it, the irony kills me. And I'm so guilty of this too, in that you sit on it and you wait, you know, whether it's the perfectionism, whether it's the fear, whether it's the whatever story, you know, limiting beliefs going on in your head. It's like, well, you know, I'm going to put it off another day. Oh, um, you know, I want to just wait until I get to this. But by virtue of you putting that actionable step off, you're doing a disservice to yourself because you're not living in your purpose. And you're also doing a disservice to all the people who may be interested right exactly. away in getting your help. Exactly. And that's what my coach said. If you don't share this, how do you, you're not going to be able to help people that need the help. And that's what really triggered exactly what you'd said. Totally. It's like getting over for me anyways. Um, it sounds similar to your, you know, your journey in that I had to get over my own high expectations and perfectionism to go, you know what? I don't need to be at some crazy level in the future. I can start helping people in this moment right now with what I have gone through and what I can do today. Exactly. I love it. Okay, diving a little bit deeper, Jane. Sure. What do you wish you had known when you first started out? Yep. So there's a, a, a lot of things. I the big thing um, is a lot of people have opinions. It doesn't mean they're the right one. So when I first started out, you know, there was it was very you know the pre 2010 even and not a lot of bloggers or lifestyle businesses that you as they are today but a lot of opinions were like you can't make money on this you're never going you know are you, can you not succeed in the corporate world is that why you want to start this business so a lot of opinions and they weren't the right ones so when you're seeking out or you're starting a new business or a new venture or a new hobby everyone is going to have an opinion does not mean you need to take their advice and that's a huge piece of advice i wish i could tell everybody Mm, I think that's so important, especially when you're going after your dreams. I oh, mean, yes. I don't, I'm not sure if you can maybe speak on this, if there were some close people to you that maybe had reservations or fears of their own and they were projecting those onto you as far as, you know, well, maybe you should go the safe route and get another real job. Did that happen to you? Oh, yeah, it happened a few times. And I distinctly remember one who was she was a a lady that I admired. and She had her own business. And I, you know, I was just putting together my website for the beginning. And I was still scared to market what I did and myself. And then she said, you know what, you're just, you know, those pictures of yourself. It's just going to, you know, I was in a professional business suit. And I was saying what I did. She's like, you're only going to attract 
male, you know, you know, if you want a husband, put that out there. And it was it's totally conservative, nothing, you know, flashy, but that was her comment to me. It was at that time marketing yourself was in a looked at in a different light or perhaps perceived the wrong way where it was totally the wrong. It was not that message at all. So it was very, as soon as someone says that I sunk into myself and thought, Oh, maybe she's right. People will think of this the wrong way. Um, even though it was not the case. Oh, goodness, girl. I Mm -hmm. totally feel you in this. (laughs) When I first started out promoting myself, promoting the work I did, being an entrepreneur, because hello, you are your own business. Yep. And like just the different, it's interesting the different perceptions and perspectives that people have. And you just kind of got to get over it, Mm -hmm. you know, like, and I know that's so much easier said than done, especially when you're developing that skin in the beginning, that tough skin. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I've just gotten in the habit of really tuning into my body and saying, like, how do I really feel? You know, like, let's shut out the opinions of every other person because they all are going to have their own yep. way of feeling things. But how do I really feel? And then I have people around me that fully I have to trust them, you know, to, to a high degree where I can go, you know what? I know that their intention is positive and pure. Where are they coming from? And does that align with how I really feel? And I think it's important to have those kind of individuals in your life where you know that they're not going to tell you the sugar-coated version. They're going to give it to you straight up. Mm -hmm. And still, even with that, you have to still filter your own feelings in that ultimately at the end of the day, I look at it like you're going to have those kind of people. You're going to have other people who just maybe you're not their cup of tea. doesn't matter. They can get a new flavor. (laughs) Exactly. You're going to have all these different opinions and ultimately you have to be happy with what you're doing and how you're living and how you're showing up on this planet. So how do you gauge valid feedback versus your internal dialogue? Well, that's a very good question. And I think you, um, you you already made kind of that, that point you have, you should have, a tribe of mentors, whether again in real life or on like everyone's real life, but online or offline that you can, you know, whether it be a coach, whether it be a mentor in a similar business or someone who understands the the business that you're in, not someone in a completely different industry that might not get how to self market or whatnot, but you should have some, some mentorship or coach that can, you could ask for, for feedback or advice or and making sure that you are still aligned with the message that you're giving out. Because again, sometimes even ourselves, we can, um, we, we want to make sure we're putting the same message out every time. So having a coach or, or a mentor is always a good thing. Mm, I absolutely agree. Now, what compelled you to become organized Jane? <laughs> It's a, so it's a great question because I was, when I first started my business, I said I didn't have a website. I, my Instagram was my own personal one, just my first and last name. I, um, I didn't have any marketing and I started to, you know, put the word out and starting to get clients. And I had written my first book while in corporate organizing for your lifestyle. So I had that website for my book and I kept using that as a brand and I wanted to get more speaking and I wanted to really, you know, go to the masses with my advice because I, I, so many people I had impact and I knew that I wanted to impact more people so I wanted speaking engagements and I reached out to you know I put a a post on Upwork for help on getting these and a PR girl reached out to me um, from LA and she said you know what you you do have the beginning of a great brand but you need to build it a bit more to to get um, more of let's say a following or before you can get more speaking engagements and she, really, I hired her and, she, and we began to get more PR. And then she eventually, she kind of nudged me a bit. She said, you know what? It'd be great if you had, you know, a logo and a brand and a website and mm-hmm. all of them. And, you know, I said, I want to write a second book and a third. So she's like, you know, she just kind of pushed me in the direction that this could. And a slowly, I, I worked that up and I hired a graphic designer. And we worked together to kind of hone in on what my brand is, what my message is. And then through that, my brand name, Organized Jane, came about. Mm. Did it come to you sporadically or did you come up with it? Like, how did that happen? How did the brand name happen? Yeah, we, you know, I hired at the beginning of August or no, beginning of July. And then October 15th was my rebrand party. So it took a few months, but it, about a month of back and forth and dialogue. And I had mentors involved, my business coach, also my, it, it didn't happen sporadically. It, was, it took some time. Um, and again, with your, when you're the face of the brand, a lot of people use their names, um, you know, 
different different ways to look at it but um it didn't it didn't it wasn't so quick yeah and i think it's also really amazing that you brought that up the fact that it takes a team like yes. people can and it, that's the thing yes you are very organized you are very living in purpose but it still takes a team and i think that's really important in business and in life to know when to delegate oh, because yes. you can't do it all you can't and your skill my skill is helping people get organized my skill is not branding or marketing or pr it's i have a certain skill but i want to hire others that have other skills that can help me and then I can help them. So it's a a two way street. So one thing that pops into my head to ask you about, because I think there, again, we're living in a time when a lot of people want to make that jump or leap into what they really are passionate about, what they really feel is their actual purpose. And a lot of times there has to be that transition stage where maybe they are typically leaving something that's bringing them money or even really good money, quote unquote. And then they, they go to nothing kind of like you did. Mm -hmm. And I know there's people that sometimes they'll put some money aside or they'll do these different things. So it's not as harsh of a all or nothing kind of thing. But for you, even when you're talking about building your team and like investing in this thing here and then investing in a bit more, if you don't mind sharing, what was the financial aspect of making that transition like for you? Yeah. And that's a good question. I think every situation is different in terms of, you know, if you have families to support or kids or um, whatever it may be, and that's, everybody has to look at their financial situation differently. And I've read a lot of books on, you know, financial prosperity and wealth. And, you know, some books advise, you know, putting aside six to eight month income to start your business. Others say you're never going to start your business while you have another job. So I think there's lots of different advice out there and, and every situation is different, but for me, you have to know, or I, I knew that I had a skill and I'd honed that skill for 10 years, getting experience in it. I'd taken courses. I was super qualified. And I think for a lot of them, if you're going to make that leap, you have to know or somewhere have in your back pocket um, the education, the skills, and the network that you're going to be able to go towards. If you don't have those yet, you might want to start kind of creating it. Um, but I don't say, you know, financially, I I I did downsize a lot. You know, I used to have a very expensive um, apartment in Zurich and an Audi, a nice car, like very, you know, when you're making corporate money, it's consistent and you you don't think about it as much. So I downsized my life um, drastically, actually, and I started investing. Instead of buying handbags or going out for dinners, I invested in my business. So it was a different mindset. But again, I knew that I had the education skills and network to make it work. Ooh, I love that you said that. I think that's honestly such just that alone, that advice on the three main areas that you need to prioritize and and really become growth oriented in for anyone Mm -hmm. looking to make that leap. That's brilliant. And then also just being really radically honest about downsizing because I think it's very easy, especially in today's times, you know, you see the social media and I'm also guilty of this at Mm -hmm. times, but I, you know, I try my best to kind of show various areas of my life and my struggles as well as my accomplishments. But I think for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people see, you know, the glam side or the luxury side or the fancy, whatever, you know, you want to call that side of things. And they don't see all the work. They don't see the fact that you do have to downsize sometimes. Mm -hmm. You do have to take a pay cut. You do have to go without and sacrifice what you're used to in the short term in order to make those massive gains in the long run. A hundred percent. And I also think um, it's a really important, like my third book that I'm going to be um, hoping to get, get a, a publishing deal soon is all about creating the life that you want, right? The money, the time, and the freedom. I think those are important things that you as an individual need to know how much you need to, to live and make, how much freedom you want in terms of, you know, can you, do you want to work from wherever or do you, you know, those type of things and how much time you want to invest in your business. So those are three things that I think also as before you take the leap into entrepreneurship, you should understand. Mm, all three are the biggest and greatest assets aside from love yes, <laughs> love of is course. like you know one of my <laughs> biggest but those three yeah girl you totally rocked it okay so I want to talk about your personal habits because obviously you're an expert at organization and I'd love to hear your take on this so what are some of your daily habits that you swear by for success Jane? 
So they're a bit different than um, you'd expect, actually. Some of the big things that I swear by is I love, you know, calendar management is key for me when I'm working. But I do, I, a lot of the times my calendar is blank on purpose because I need that time to reflect, to be creative. So for myself, I need to make sure that I block out time for, you know, just relaxing and chilling and being creative versus having like a full on day. And that's where I think in the corporate world, we're so used to like our calendars full, we're being managed by our emails, but I really try and, you know, check emails only twice a day and, and leave time for creativity. That's one of my biggest habits now. I love that. That reminds me of the four-hour work week from Tim Ferriss. That was one of the things that I tried to adopt as well when I first read it was that fact of, you know, a lot, a lot time in your schedule for certain things and don't be a slave to things like email and don't be a slave to things like don't be so reactive more Mm -hmm. than anything exactly and it's you know email is a great tool but it shouldn't be the way you plan your life i know that could be a sticky subject for some people probably listening out there because i know (laughs) right now even myself i i'm totally guilty of that as well where there's times when you do feel like okay i have to get back to this person i have to get back to this person i have to get back to this person and then in those times i find it best to literally as much as like i might have a million things to do i actually need to take a step back and in doing so even if it's five minutes of me like just getting grounded, getting focused, breathing, I can then re-immerse into that crazy busy world again, but with such a fresh perspective and then prioritize accordingly. Oh yeah. I love that. Yeah. Love it. And, and love it. not really losing, not losing that focus again. And the next point that I, that a habit that is going to surprise some people because a lot of people are really, you know, trying to get off social media and not you know, not be, not, not scroll for hours on things, but I say, you know, I don't say you should be doing that, but I say use social media at, to your advantage and, you know, have slots. I, my downtime is usually after lunch around three o'clock where I get tired. So I spend 15 minutes and I do, you know, I engage with potential, you know, clients and audience. And that's how I found y- yourself. And just, there is so many inspiring men and women on social media and it shouldn't be looked at as a negative tool, but a positive tool if used the right way. So that's another one of my um, tips that I always do. I love that should be like a, a rule for social media because you're right. It's a tool mm-hmm. and it can be used for such goodness if you do it strategically. Exactly. And I think a lot of our society now is looked at as a bad thing because we're wasting time. Of course, you can waste time, you know, watching TV or you can waste time doing anything. Um, mm. but social media, you can actually use it to your advantage if used correctly. I think a key word that just popped into my head about this and the statement you just made about anything in life is just awareness. You know, like mm-hmm. how are you like how are you be being proactively aware? aware of what you're using in your life, whether that's food, whether that's social media, whether that's other resources, like the awareness and the intention, intentionality behind what is, you know, why are you doing this? Yeah, no, I love that. That's a setting those intentions. I, that's a a great advice. So are there any other daily habits that you swear by for success? Yeah. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not as exciting as other people you probably had because I do make my bed. I swear by a laser focus closet for myself. And that's one of the habits that I've, since I was a young girl, I've always had an organized closet and not just, it doesn't have to look purpose or, you know, pretty and, and organized, but it has to fit a purpose. My clothes have to make me feel good. They have to give me confidence and I don't want to waste any time looking for things or on the flip side, worrying about my look. So for myself, not those two, like knocking off those two time wasters at the beginning of my day always helps me, you know, lead a successful day. Mm, That is a really wonderful piece of advice just alone right there. And I remember, so for those listening, um, some of you do know this, some of you don't. I spoke recently at Jane's book launch, which was amazing, like such a, just a, such a high vibes event. And you revealed a statistic about how much time on average women spend just worried about their looks. Can you please share that? Because it was literally shocking. Oh, yeah. It was 627 hours a year. And that was by, I think in the UK, the Telegraph did this study. And that is a shocking amount of time that women spent worrying about our looks. I'm not saying that's only Say clothes. that again. How many hours? Yeah, 627 hours <laughs> a year. 
OMG. Yeah. Like I, yeah. And it's, again, it goes deeper than only clothes in your closet. But I mean, if we eliminate that part of it and you don't, I say 10 minutes a day, if you, if you spend in your closet worrying about what to wear, can't, you can't find anything. That's 60 hours a week just there. Or that's a insane. Year. So it, it really is insane. And, and as women, we should be focused on being a boss, you know, on our businesses, on our podcasts, on being showing up, you know, in our for our families. We need to focus on that rather than worrying. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, one thing that I'm absolutely obsessed with and I always love diving into with guests on the show is what your morning routine looks like. Yes. So my morning routine, as um, I mentioned earlier, is quite, you know, I get up, I make my bed, I go to my, my clothes are already laid out for the day. And usually I have my fitness clothes the first thing, but I like to get up straight away. I like to do some kind of movement before I check any of my emails or social media, sweat, get that done before I can really start getting ready for whether it's working at home or going out for the day or traveling. But that's my kind of morning routine and is there anything else that's in there like those are kind of broad general here 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 Mm -hmm. is there something in there that is really unique to you that you think you know yeah I I feel like I'm such a boring morning person when I come to think of it (laughs) because at my routine is more I'm not really a morning person per se but I strive to be because um, you get a lot done but for me it's more of the afternoon when I finish my work day that's when I my routine actually starts and I spend 10 minutes a day organizing my computer. I spend 10 minutes a day setting strategies for the next day. So I would say my morning routine is more done in the, you know, the afternoon or evening where I spend planning for the next day and making sure that I have seven priorities and then three that my top three that I'm going to accomplish the next day. Those are the type of things. So when I wake up, I already know what my day will look like. Okay. So you said you do that after work. I'm curious then. Do you have, because I know you put your clothes on and stuff. So take me through your nighttime routine yes. then. That's much more exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I my... like it all, Jane. I am like OCD <laughs> organized Virgo. I love it all. So take me through your jam of the best nighttime routine. Oh my gosh. My best nighttime routine is depending on, you know, I always have this philosophy. I do my best work actually at nighttime, even until midnight sometimes. And I've written like, Mm -hmm. I I write my courses, my books, but I, I really, before, you know, when I'm in my, you know, my groove and I'm getting a lot of work done, I'll just work until I'm I'm tired. But for me, it it, it flows at nighttime. But before I, yeah, get into even my my creative space I make sure that I you know take some time usually around 8 p.m at night or whatnot I look at my agenda for the next day and I go over kind of the big priorities that I want to accomplish that next day and I make sure there's not more than three and this isn't tasks like you know going to the get groceries or something it's really business priorities so I link these three down um, or I write them down in my journal and I circle them sometimes there's up to seven and I just really say tomorrow I want to accomplish these three things and then I say okay what do I need to wear for the next day sometimes it's as simple as my roots jogging pants because I'm going to be at home (laughs) but um, Mm -hmm. again it just takes that you know the morning out of it because again I'm not that morning person so I want it to be organized and when I wake up not even think about it so for me the nighttime routine is really um, looking at what's ahead and for another key thing that I do at nighttime is every day I don't not do this is 10 minutes at least I spent organizing my computer because today digital organization is the hottest topic we are all stressed when we open our computers our files are everywhere our inboxes are a mess our you know sometimes our computer hard drives are full so I spend 10 minutes deleting going through things and making sure that it's clean for the next morning mm, I love that I will say Mike I I'm pretty proud of my MacBook <laughs> oh, I love Pro <laughs> desktop. It's it's literally I have it down to three significant folders with sub folders within all of those folders. It's very neat and oh, organized. I love, oh, I love it. <laughs> I know. I love it. I love organization. Hence yeah. why you're even on the show because <laughs> I, I love chatting about this with you. Um, okay, so what would you say, Jane? Because I know you've talked about the daily habits of success, the morning routine. What would you say some of your self-care and spiritual rituals are that you love to practice? So 
spiritually, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but um, when I was starting my business too, I, you know, that tribe of mentors I was talking about, one of them is people I don't know, authors, I, you know, Jen Sincero, the badass books, Gabby Bernstein, and I wasn't really that spiritual before I started even my business. And I looked to these, so as kind of a self-care when I, you know, when I have time or I'm, you know, ironing or doing a mundane task, I always go back to audible books that I've, that have inspired me. And that's where my spiritual side comes in. And a lot of those books are about taking your own, your skills and showing them to the world and being able to live your best self. So that's for me is the biggest self-care. Yeah. It's an investment of your time and yourself and And growth. And that's why I love podcasts because your time is so valuable, but you can listen to podcasts while you're doing tasks or driving or th- that's the podcast or an audible books are incredible for that. So for me, the biggest self-care is listening to, you know, your podcast, your guests, um, what they can bring you to your life. And all of those are a great time uh, or a great way to use your time while also um, using self-care. I love that. And then on the spiritual side of things, I, would you say you have some spiritual rituals that you turn to? You know, I, the meditation, I never I meditated in my life until I started my own business. And I, I, um, read the books by Gabby Bernstein, the universe has your back. Um, and then it, it, she kind of, and, and I didn't even know how to meditate, but if you go on her website, she gives you these free meditation guides. So I don't say it's a morning routine or a nighttime routine, but I meditate sporadically when I feel like I need it. And that has been one of the spiritual practices I've worked into my life. That is beautiful. And I often, as someone who has taught meditation and just a little plug in here, love you guys, but you guys know, I, uh, <laughs> if you don't know, I actually do have a full podcast that I created just on meditation, whether you want to start one or deepen it. And I also did a blog post on it on my website. So you guys can go check those out if you want to get into it or deepen it, because I do agree with you. It doesn't have to be a morning or nighttime thing. You know, the real meditation really is how you live your life. But I do believe in taking those mental breaks throughout the day. And I, you know, some for some people, it's a beautiful way to start your day. For other people, like you said, it's a great way to just, you know, step away and sporadically, you know, tune into yourself, ground yourself, and then go back to whatever you were doing. Yes. And I love that you mentioned that because if you have a podcast and a blog post, it's a lot of times we don't know where to start. So you can Google it now and find, you know, ways to help. But, you know, going to your podcast and your blog post is exactly what, you know, I can use or other people can use just to get started. It's just that Mm -hmm. where to find the info. Totally. Yeah, I actually on my, and again, this is just if anyone wants help out there, I actually have a freebie that I put together because I had people that were constantly asking, like, how do I even start? As you said, that was kind of a big um, challenge for people when they were getting into a meditation practice. Like, how do I even begin this? It was so intimidating, so overwhelming. They didn't even want to like go there. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to put something together that can help people just start their journey with meditation. Super simple, super easy. There's a, there's a part of my website where you can go to, I believe it's just like start here and then you click on it and literally you just type in your email and you actually get sent a link to a private video I created. And it's a 15 minute video, um, where I guide you through a meditation. Oh, I love this. I'm going to go do this right after this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to send you the like, I'll put the link below for you guys who are listening. I would be happy to put the link below. It's just a really basic, you know, how to, you know, get started. Um, But I think it could help a lot of people. So I appreciate you sharing the meditation. I'm happy to share it with you, Carl. Um, And the one thing that I am curious about right now is what are you curious about, Jane? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm curious about so many, when I look at, you know, online to my tribe of mentors, and I'm always curious about how people got the, you know, the willpower and the, you know, the guts to start their own business and to start marketing themselves. So I always ask people, I'm always curious about, you know, when was, like you've asked me, when was the transition? How did you do it? What inspired you? Mm, Wow, Zuz, I love that. Yes, I believe curiosity is one of the fundamental traits that keeps you young. It keeps you on your game. It keeps you growing. It's like curiosity is such a beautiful trait to have. Oh, it is. And today, you know, I always try to think in abundance too. And there's so many people doing 
very similar businesses. There's a million podcasts out there and books and, and, you know, coaches. But it's so interesting when you actually start to get to know them and ask them how they started their journey or what, you know, what sets them apart. And we all have to have something that differentiates us. But we also have to be aware that there's a lot of people looking for, you know, advice and support. And that's why there can be so many of us. But it's still interesting to see what that trigger was for people to start their business. And I'd love to ask you that you that as well. (laughs) Oh, well, you and I are going to have a girl date, I'm sure, after this podcast anyways. Mm -hmm. I won't won't get into that on this podcast. I mean, a lot of my other podcasts do go into sort of, you know, my personal journey. Mm -hmm. And again sharing your story and and what inspires you and i actually think marie forleo i'm sure um a lot of people i love her new book everything is figure outable it's great Uh, right Mm -hmm. she's amazing she really is she is such a skilled woman at what she does and i love her philosophy that everyone has their own unique abilities and gifts to offer the world but at the same time it's like one of the videos she did like a long time ago, was, I think it was more like one of the videos from the first season or second season of Marie TV. And it was all about the fact that, and I'd love that you just brought that up because I think that's something, what I'm going to say is something that people struggle with this. Well, you know, I want to start my own business, but there's so many other people out there who are doing something similar to what I want to do. Or, you know, well, there's so many, you know, writers, there's so many coaches, there's so many whatever that blank is for you, you need to hear this straight from Jane and I, or me and Jane today, even if there's a million other people who look like that they're doing something similar to what you want to do with your life. Do you boo? Like, do you, there's always going to be a unique spin that you have that nobody else on this planet has. Totally agreed. And um, I think Marie does a great job in her book on that too. And just, you really need to own that and get support and, and mentors to help you own it. If you're, if there's something holding you back. Completely. And also like tuning into yourself, you know, like that's how you really get to know yourself is when you're not so focused on the externals and you really do develop the most beautiful, deep relationship with yourself within because that's when you really discover your true gifts that's when you really tap into you know that that internal vibe of yours that's when you can really you know figure figure outable <laughs> i love that word but that's when you really figure out what your unique ability is when you really start to tune into yourself and just ignore and tune out all the external outward noises exactly and being able to, you know, focus and have the time and the, the reflection, give yourself that time is super important. Absolutely. Okay, Jane, what's something you failed at? And I'm just, I always do a caveat to this question because failure, the word in itself, means many different things to many different people. So if you want to even speak on what the word first off means to you, that's cool. If not, then something that you have failed at. Yeah, I think that word we're we're so in today's society we're we're you know in, in school failure is bad getting you know it's we're we're trained to think failure is bad we're in business it's a good thing really because then you understand what is you did wrong and you can improve on it and I think today we should be taught a little like you know the they, they say the true you know startups and entrepreneurs they have 10 failed businesses before they have a successful one so it's you know we should be more adapt to not being scared to fail but it, this very business I have, I failed 10 years ago. In 2009, I started it and I failed. So that was for me, it was a, it was the reason was because I didn't have the, the strength or the, I was missing some key components that I needed confidence wise and, and again, mentors to help me through it. What, when you say you failed at it, what did, what did failure look like to you at that point? So failure to me was, you know, starting the business. I did everything correctly, you know, registering in Canada. We have to get a GST number. When I got my ducks in a row, I had a website. I had all the content ready to go. I had, you know, offers for different offers for businesses and different offers for people. But again, I was, I didn't market it. So I had no customers and I had to shut it down and go back to the corporate world. So for me, it was um, giving in or to, to my dreams of what I believe would really help people and, and going back to, to regular, to a job. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think that a lot of times 
people who want to start a new business and dive into that, a lot of times they actually do all the, and I don't want to call it fluff because that all the, all, everything you mentioned is absolutely necessary. I've been there. I've done it myself. But a lot of that is like kind of the, the, the flash stuff. Whereas yeah. bottom line, bare bones, you need to market yourself and you need to have clients. If you don't have clients who are paying you for your business or your skills or your services, you don't have an actual business. Exactly. And that's, you, that is the, the best advice too in terms of you need to be able, like the fluff, like you, it is not fluff, but it's, you, you need to get the, the clients or what in, I started this business again and I had none of that. And I just went and asked clients and that's where the money started coming in. So again, it's important to have, but not necessary even in the beginning. Totally. I love, love, love that you said that. I'm so guilty of that where I've gone and spent time, you know, working on the website or trying to change this or rebrand that or blah, blah, blah. And again, I'm not saying that stuff is not important. It absolutely is fundamental to a part of your business success. But if that's what your primary focus is on and you're not actually like attaining or retaining your clients, you don't actually have an operating business. Exactly. And then also in terms of that, I think I failed too, because, you know, it's, I I needed to do that and put my, you know, my offers out there and market them, but I also needed to give it time. And I think a lot of today, a lot of people are like, oh, you're like an overnight success. I was like, no, this has been 10, (laughs) 10, this took, this has taken me 10 years to get here. You know, I written a book five years ago and then I started, I really started this business. Even when I had failed, I was still doing the business in the background because I thought someday I'm going to start this again. So really it's taken me 10 years to get where I am today. Oh, bless you for saying that, Jane, because, you know, I, I see this so often and I've, you know, I listen to interviews all the time. I am definitely an observer of life and people and so many people who I have heard interviews on have said that kind of 10 year mark. There's something about the 10 years. Like if you really, really put effort into something over the period of 10 years, it's usually around that 10 year mark where you quote unquote, get the overnight 10 year (laughs) in reality, 10 year success. I've heard that too. Actually, another, a a Vancouver um, clothing label too. I just, I was chatting with her and she's, it's taken her 10 years to build her clothing label. And now she's got a, you know, a big brand, right? So it's, it's, it might be the 10 year mark. (laughs) I think there, it's like, I I don't want to call it 10 year itch. It's more like 10 year loving scratch. Yes, exactly. (laughs) But a lot of people are like, Oh, I want to write a book and I'm just going to, you know, tomorrow I'm going to like get publishers and do this. And I'm like, you know what you need to, it takes so much time to build a business. And just because you have an Instagram account and you're going to do this, you need to massage that you could be two years without income who knows but it's you need to put in that time it does not happen overnight oh I love that you're saying this too because you are all about organization and calendaring and scheduling and all of you know that good stuff what would you say would be your best advice for people who if they wanted to start a business and they have all these goals, how do you help your clients or even help me, for example, if I have A, B, and C that I want to accomplish um, in my business, how would you walk through, walk someone through the prioritization of their time management and their realistic timelines? Yes, yeah, a great question. And I have an exercise that I do with clients in the very beginning, especially when we're talking about, you know, their businesses and their time they spend in their businesses. And we go through an exercise where I spend a week. Um, it's not a lot of time, but it gives you a good sense of where you're spending your time. And we do an exercise together. I ask you to track your time and I help you with it and I give you these um, kind of templates. But what it does after that week, we can kind of analyze where your time is being spent. And 80% of your time should be on revenue generating activities. But often when we go through this exercise, we find that a lot of it is on you know, website, marketing, accounting, you know, tasks that are not revenue generating. And usually it's the opposite. It's 80% on those tasks. So that's where really an aha moment comes in. And we need to look at those tasks in terms of can they be outsourced, eliminated or automated because they are what's holding you back from getting more clients. I know that's a piece of advice in itself as far as the three that you just mentioned, automate, delegate or outsource. That in itself is brilliant. What is something else someone can do aside from tracking their time and looking at it? Like what's another strategy people can use so that they can 
invest more of their time into actual income generating activities. Yeah, I, I sell these time blo- or time cubes on my site, Organized Jane, and not to put a plug in here, but I think today we are so distracted. All of us entrepreneurs or even, you know, working all through the day, we're checking our Instagram, we're checking our emails, we're checking things, we're going on YouTube, we're distracted by, you know, the dog needs to go out. All of these things are a constant distractor. So if you are working on a project or something that is important, maybe it's a client proposal and you get pulled away automatically takes 20 minutes to get refocused again. So locking yourself in a room with a timer for 30 minutes and only working on that client proposal, for example, for 30 minutes uninterrupted, you will get more done than if you spend six hours working on it interrupted. So really getting that time blocking or setting alarms to only be focused. I love that. And you are so welcome to plug your beautiful tools on this podcast. <laughs> it's all about being organized. And if you can provide a tool, whether it's a physical tool or otherwise to the audience that can help them, I'm so happy to have you do that. One of the things that I love doing personally, and this is actually, this was free for people out there listening who want better time management that I found that helps me is using the Pomodoro. I would imagine you're familiar with that, but it's basically just uh, like a a time tracker as well that Mm -hmm. you can get online. And because some people, you know, some people are more into a physical tool and they like seeing it, feeling it, touching it, all of that stuff. Other people might be more into the digital thing. So I think the point is just find something that helps you to track your time and really become aware of where you're actually spending your minutes during the day. Exactly. And that's why that exercise I mentioned where you take clients through, it's, we don't like doing this. You know, when we, we start a new weight loss plan or whatever, and they say, write your food down, we hate doing it. We hate writing down our time, but it's the only way we understand where we're spending it. And yes. it's, it's that you can't measure what you don't know, right? So it's how do you understand where you're spending your time? And a lot of times the email is a big one or meetings. And um, the Harvard Business Review did a, a extensive study on CEOs and spent six months tracking every 15 minutes of their time. Their assistants tracked it, but it was a really extensive study. And it found that most often their time is wasted with emails and meetings. And the meetings could have been, you know, I say instead of having an hour meeting, if a meeting needs to take you eight minutes, schedule eight minutes. It's um, you need to kind of understand where you're wasting your time. And that's the biggest kind of advice I can give. Because it's, if it's email even, how do you outsource that email? Or how do you, you know... Today, we can do that. There's lots of ways you can get digital assistance, virtual assistance to help you manage your time and your tools that you have better. Yeah, I often say it's not a lack of resources. It's a lack of being not resourceful. Yes, or even aware. You might not understand or you might not know how much time you're actually wasting responding to emails that somebody else could have done for you. And all these beautiful nuggets of wisdom you guys are available in Jane's amazing books and content. So I'm so happy that, again, we're sharing your advice on this podcast, but that there's also ways that they can go and look at the resources you've created as well to then help them save their time, which is one of the most valuable assets we have. Yes. That being said, I am really, really curious about which hurdles you've had to personally face and how you overcame them. And the side note to that question is whether or not the solution you found was obvious or if it was something you stumbled upon. Yeah, the biggest hurdle for me was really, um, I was, you know, I'm 37 now, so I was position. it was just in society, it was really, you need to, well, in Canada, at least, you know, go to university, I got an MBA, I had to kind of climb that corporate ladder to be successful. And for me, the hurdle was getting over that belief. You know, I thought that I had to be a VP of a big company in order for society to think I was successful. So that was a huge hurdle. And sometimes I still even think, oh, maybe I need to be working for a big company. And it's, it's that societal pull that is, is a hurdle that I'm still, sometimes, like I said, still struggle with. But it's something that we need to, you can, everybody has their own path on what they think success is. And we don't need to care what other people think it is. So I always say, do what you think is best and what's going to help the most amount of people. And that's how I overcome that hurdle of, think, of what people think I should be doing or what, you know, society thinks or, or what even my old thought pro- th- process was. But do what you think is best and what will help the most people. 
So when you're in those moments where that limiting belief or that old story comes into your mind, what do you literally do to shift your energy in that state? Oh, it's a great question. Because sometimes I still, it, it, it swims back to me and I'm like, oh my God, I should go back and, you know, sometimes I don't know why, but it comes back to me and I start even looking online and thinking like, oh my gosh, I should apply for you know, a corporate role just in case, you know, if I don't get any more clients next year. And as soon as that happened, I have to say no. And I actually go back to, I look at the audible books that have, um, I usually pop one on because they're so motivating. And I go back to my content and I go, I scroll through my Instagram. I look at the comments on my YouTube videos that have said, great work. You've helped me. I go back to testimonials from old clients and I pick up one of my physical books and say, look what I've accomplished. And that we need to celebrate those small successes. I do at least to help me overcome that hurdle still. Jane, you just made my heart so happy. Like (laughs) everything you said was such great advice because yes, 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 yes. To all of the above. I am. I actually mentioned this when I was at your event to the audience, but basically what I do, which kind of encompasses all of what you just said is I have a folder that I have created where I put people's feedback, you know, whether it's clients I've helped overcome something, whether it's, you know, beautiful comments people have left or messages people have sent me, you know, if they've listened to my podcast and they've like, you know, overcome something because of that. Or, you know, if I've changed their life in some way, if a a client of mine has overcome a huge obstacle because of the work that I'm doing, or just somehow for me to be reminded of why, like, why am I doing this? What is my purpose? And why am I continuing to live this life that I do in the way that I do to serve? And in those moments, yes, all of what you just said, whether it's the comments or messages, messages or it doesn't just have to be direct feedback. It could be maybe it's the audible books that you said or people that are kind of living a similar journey and talking about the the fact that we are born to serve, you know, like self is such a beautiful reminder of like why we do the work that we do. Exactly. And I remember your talk actually that was one of the big takeaways from you was having that folder of you know, because a lot of audience questions were about negative feedback and how we deal with it. And, you know, sometimes we do feel like we want to quit our business. So how do we overcome that? And your your answer was just so well spoken in terms of you have a folder and that's what you go to. So I love that organization. I think I'm going to start one. Oh, that makes me so, I feel so uh, excited for you to have that to turn to, even mm-hmm. though you already do that, but to have it organized. Yes, I no love it. <laughs> have an organized goodness folder. I love it, Jane. Okay. What are some of the resources or support that are available for people out there? I know you mentioned your time cube that people can purchase, but if you want to just touch on some of your personal recommendations for how to get more organized in your life. And feel free again to mention some of your own, but also if you could mention some tools or resources that are not from you as well. Yep, sure. So um, for me, I've read a lot of books on time management and getting organized. And the book that you mentioned, Decluttering for Dummies, which um, is split into three parts. The first part is all about mental decluttering because today we are so distracted. So and the second part is all about physical stuff. So we're from everything from our closets to our garages to our offices. And the third part is really on digital organization. And that's where I, the topic I think is going to be huge for 2020 because we're all cluttered in our phones, in our computers, so for and in our inboxes. So that's um, a big topic. And some tools. Um, Mandy mentioned the time cube to help you stay on track, especially for digital uh, tasks. Other tools and resources that I like to um, recommend are, you know, other books on time management. Um, Tim Ferriss, even though it doesn't seem like only time management, but it, they really give some good tips in terms of, you know, from time blocking to email management. Um, also different blog posts and or bloggers and podcasts that I listen to. Marie Forilo being one of them who actually, she talks a lot about progress versus um, perfection. And, mm. and, and how that relates. I also listen to, you know, bloggers and uh, like the Skinny Confidential I follow, a lifestyle blogger, but she's immaculate at planning her time. And she gives a lot of resources and even a downloadable um, calendar and priority checklist, which I actually use. So that's the Skinny Confidential. And if you Google um, uh, in her, uh, on her blog, kind of time management or calendar blocking, those, those free downloadable sheets will show up. 
And then also just, you know, lastly is, you know, from the books to, you know, time tracking or time cubes to, you know, resources online, but really just simplifying it down and understanding, you know, taking the time to maybe it's maybe you need to hire a business coach or a time management coach or take a course because whatever you invest kind of money into, um, you will do. And that's what I say, you know, if, even if it's a course you pay a thousand dollars for, you actually do the work. And you'll get the benefit out of it. The same with hiring a coach. And for me, those are the biggest kind of time management savings is hiring professionals to help you get there. Yeah. And I actually just want you to plug into yourself a little bit because I know Organized Chain, clearly you help people organize, but what are the actual services you offer if people are interested in working with you? Yeah. So I used to offer one-on-one coaching. Um, I don't do that very much anymore because um, my, my time is, it, it was too hard to go everywhere. But now I still offer um, speaking engagements, my books, and my online courses, which will be revamped in January. So they'll be, one of them will be about organizing your business processes, especially for new entrepreneurs. And then I'll have one on digital photo organizing and digital email or email management. So those are my three kind of um, online courses. And then otherwise I go to companies and, and, you know, if you, if you're working for a company or have a company and I actually go in and work directly with the people there. So it's more of a service, um, not one-on-one, but more of a group coaching environment. Well, all of those sound like beautiful holiday gifts. First off, I'm going to say, <laughs> yes. I mean, any time of the year, if you can, again, what you said is brilliant. I totally agree because I've invested, you know, a lot of money myself into self development over the years. And anytime I do, the return on investment is just it's it's priceless, really. Exactly. And whatever you pay for something like this, I feel like you actually are devoted to it. Where a free course online, it might be so much value in it, but we don't take it seriously or we don't invest time in it. But as soon as you put a dollar amount to it, we're invested. Yes, we are. Okay, Jane, what has been one life changing or defining moment of time in your life? Oh, that is such a good question. But I really remember um, the life-changing moment was when I was very young, probably eight years, eight or just under 10, eight, between eight to 10. And I remember that I was um, in grade school, whatever grade it was, and I was organizing my desk. And the teacher was like, Jane, you're so organized. Can you show the class how you are so organized? And for me, I got up there and I was showing the class and telling them my wisdom. I was like, this is what I meant to do. So that for me was kind of life-changing. Oh, I love you sharing that. That just warms my heart. I feel so special to have you on here sharing that sweet little moment because, you know, I, uh, I'll never forget in my journalism school graduation, the head speaker for the graduate or at the graduation ended up having this speech all surrounding the topic of, you know, living your purpose and doing what you love to do. And he swore that if you really and truly think back to your childhood, there will be one defining moment that literally you were doing what you were meant to be doing back then. You might just not have been aware of it. Oh my gosh. I love that. I've never heard that, but that could possibly be it. Totally. And Mm -hmm. it's a matter of connecting the dots, looking back and going, what, like what in my childhood or when in my childhood did I have moments like that where I can think back to like just being in my purest and, you know, sweetest state and I was doing something. And now in my adulthood, what is that one thing that could translate to what I, what I can do today as my purpose? Like that to me, that was such a light bulb moment. Oh my gosh, I've never put those together, but you're you're right. And I like how you said connect the dots too. Completely, completely. So you sharing that just brought that totally up for me. Like, whoa, girl, you were aware enough to think back and go, okay, you were organizing way back when you were eight years old and you were also rewarded for that in a sense by having spotlight by your teacher go, you know, teach others like, Hello, girl. That's what you're doing today. Yeah, it's it's actually that's amazing that you brought that up. I I love hearing this. <laughs> that's right, though. It's really true. <laughs> I love it. I love this question because I think it it just allows the audience to connect so much with you, um, in a personal way. What does a successful relationship look like to you? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess it can be romantic or non-romantic in <laughs> this question. But uh, I, I like to think it's more of like for coming from me, my intention with this question is more so on the intimate side. OK. And even if you are and you feel free to or not to share on your personal, you know, connections in your life right now, but or connection, I should say. But um, for me, it's just about like in your mind, what does that, you know, successful relationship look like to you? Yeah. And for me, that's a really good question because I've been looking for this for a long time. And I feel like it's really important that both of you have the, like, not just the respect, but the, the desire to help each other build your goals. And it can be, whether it's, you know, a business goal or a family goal or even a vacation prop, whatever it is, you need to have those, be able to support each other to achieve those goals. And it could be just as simple as, you know, words of encouragement, or it could be actually physically getting involved in the business, whatever it may be, but you need to be on the same page with that. For me, that's what a successful relationship looks like. Partnership, teamwork. Exactly. I'm always, I'm all for like the winning team, right? Like you're two players, not literally, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not literally, but you're two players on the same team. Like exactly. That's- that's how I look at relationships too. And I love that about you. And I know that you have that mindset where it's all about collaboration versus, oh, yes. you know, competition and, and supporting and uplifting others. Now, when it comes to your personal life, because I know you're such a fierce, fearless female entrepreneur, um, have you found that there has been like a lot of female, especially female entrepreneurs I talk to have, um, challenges when it comes to balancing that personal life, that those intimate relationships, the friends, the the health and business all at once. Have you found that to be a challenge for you? Oh, a huge challenge. And it, it really changed when I, um, when I be- became an entrepreneur and started really, you know, putting my passion out there and explaining what I do and putting myself out there. A lot of, you know, good friends even were not in supportive of it. And now they're no longer friends because that to me, if you can't support someone following their passion, that is not a good friend. Where before, you know, I had the weekends and we could go do our brunches or whatever lunches. And it was, you know, we talked about whatever it made the theme of the office or whatnot. But now I feel like, you know, your your friendships change, um, romantic relationships too. Your time is... um, spent differently you always want to be working and it's a good thing because you love what you're doing but you also sacrifice some of that you know I no longer think of weekends as weekends I think of them as a normal day to work but for somebody who has a a job that is not you know a Monday to Friday they want your time to go and do activities which is important so you have to be open to communicate your new lifestyle and the way your business now operates and I think that you need to have a partnership respect that and you also have to respect their wishes if they would like more of your time for an activity how can you make that work compromise communication connection all the c's i love and yes i completely agree and with that being said like even just dating in itself as an entrepreneur i mean that can be a really big challenge how how do you navigate dating as an entrepreneur (laughs) it is so tough because uh you know, I had actually, in, when I was working in the corporate world, I actually lost a relationship because I ended up getting a similar job to to my then um, boyfriend at the time. And there was this competition factor. So I, you know, and I wasn't prepared to leave my career. So, you know, that, that, that ended the relationship. And then now that I'm an entrepreneur, I find um, I, when I moved back to Vancouver, I had a relationship that didn't work out because I was always busy, but super happy, but focused. And I didn't, I didn't have that time at the, that, that, that that they required of me. And, and um, now I'm in a new relationship where, you know, they are equally as busy and also have their own business, but they're super focused, but we also challenge each other on our business goals. And I think that's really important. And we're both out there to kind of help each other and grow. And um, yeah, I think that's what, I think your needs change as you become an entrepreneur on both sides. I just feel so grateful that you shared that because I think so many people listening out there, whether they're in the corporate world or whether they're, you know, an entrepreneur or solopreneur, you know, majority of people listening out there, I know you guys are really hardworking. You're really ambitious. You want it all. You want the amazing relationship. You want your health in top shape. You want your business thriving. You want your 
life to be a reflection of all the biggest dreams that you have within all your deepest desires to be met. And you are a living, walking, breathing example that you can have it all. It does take organization, (laughs) but you can have that dream relationship. You can have the dream job. You can have all that stuff simultaneously. Yeah. And I think obviously some things are going to, you know, it's not that having it all looks different to every type of person. Um, You know, having it all might be a huge house in the country, which then you're going to require a lot of work on that house. So maybe you don't have that. You have a small condo and a cleaning lady, right? It's different. Totally. And and that's why I think, I don't think having it all is, is, I think it's so different to different people, but I think we can definitely still have relationships and be entrepreneurs, but you're going to have to find the right balance or the right individual that can, that can handle that and wants to be part of the journey. I love that. I love it so much. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful way to describe a successful relationship and also just the inner elements that are required in order to have that next level relationship in your life. And it's really hard, especially, you know, when we're putting ourselves out there on social media, we're doing photo shoots, like my pictures all over, you Google me like yourself too. It's, it's a bit of a challenge and especially where other people don't like that. So you want to keep a little bit of your life private. So it's, it's also, you need to have those discussions and, and boundaries. Uh, um, yes. for each other. Oh girl, you said one of my favorite words. <laughs> B, 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 boundaries. <laughs> yes. mm-hmm. Yeah, I do think there is something to be said, especially if you're more of a public figure, even if you're not, you know, with social media and the accessibility to people nowadays, I still always, no matter how, you know, how big my brand gets or how big my products are are pushed out there or whatnot or things that I'm creating in the world, I will always maintain a level of privacy when it comes to my literal, my private life. Yeah, me too. And I think it's, um, it's, and and maybe it might be different if I had a relationship with somebody who was very public, right? That it's different. But um, Mm -hmm. again, I think it's a a discussion you need to have with your partner on what they, what their um, expectations are too. Absolutely. Oh, I love this discussion, girl. I can talk to you all day long about relationships, but I'll move along. If you had to recommend one book that could positively change someone's life aside from yours, what book would it be? You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. And why is that? Because it literally tells you um, that you are the, you, your skills are needed in the world and that you can conquer anything once you put your mind to it. Amazing. What quote do you live by and why this one? For every minute spent organizing, an hour is earned by Benjamin Franklin because he was a super organized guy. Very beautiful. What is your favorite word? Curate. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I've become, I've had this brand, I really love to curate things and, and make things look nice, even though it's not, I, I love that word. What do you feel most grateful for in your life right now? That I get to spend time with my parents over the holidays. Oh, I love it. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you could have lunch with one person alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, aside, well, Martha Stewart. Ooh, okay. And if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Chocolate. <laughs> As I had a number of servings yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I love chocolate. I'm, orig- I'm originally Swiss, so we just love chocolate. Mm, girl, I totally feel you. Okay, winding it down now, what are you most excited about that's coming up? Uh, my online course, my online course is for January, my, re- my revamped ones. Mm, okay, cool. And what does paradise mean to you? Obviously, this is Pave Your Paradise podcast all about creating inner happiness so you can reflect that in your external world. So how would you personally define paradise for you? For me, having enough money, having um, my time that I can use the way I want to spend it and the freedom to make my own, you know, it's freedom to spend my own time. So time, money, and freedom and having myself kind of dictate how that looks. Beautiful definition, Jane. Thank you. Is there anything else you wish we talked about today? Oh, why wow. we talked about a lot, but um, I really love getting a bit more deeper into kind of entrepreneurialism. And I think we, we did that a lot in terms of how it affects relationships, how to, you know, advice we can give in new entrepreneurs and anyone starting their business. That's what I love talking about, too, because I think if I had that 10 years ago, maybe my business wouldn't have failed. All right. 
tell me what your top piece of advice would be then for any new entrepreneur starting out. Take me back to the starting out Jane. And if you could bestow one golden nugget of wisdom on that newly starting out entrepreneur, what would it be? So, you know, whatever your passion is, never devalue it. Never think it isn't worthwhile, whether it's a hobby, a business idea, maybe it's already a business, whatever your passion is, don't devalue it because somebody out there will want to, you know, enlist your skills and services for that passion. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing that with the audience because guys, if you're listening out there, please take this to heart, literally take this to heart and also take it to your mind. You can create whatever life you want. You really, really can. And Jane is a walking example. I'm a walking example. It takes a shift in your mindset and an immense amount of belief. But when you believe in yourself and you truly believe in those moments when you're struggling, that there are people out there who you can serve and who need your help and are willing to pay for it because there always are. Yep. then you can be a success at no matter what it is that you want to do with your life. That is so well said, Mandy. And and if, if anybody listening, if that helps even one person, I will be so happy. Right. Or we, and, and you as well, it's just like, we can just spread the message and understand that you believe in it. You have that skill and you're out there to serve and help people. You will be successful. Amen, sister. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're such a server yourself of helping others and assisting others to be their best in a variety of ways. How can I and the audience of listeners serve you? How can we help you in the highest way? I love this question. Oftentimes we don't ask that enough, but I always, I try and always ask that too. Like, what can I do for your business? And for me, it's really, um, I, I would love it if you go to Organize Jane and, you know, you follow me on Instagram and you can watch some of my YouTube videos. But I want you to, like, look to for the advice that can help you the most. You know, if you're looking for a video on calendar management, I have that. Or if it's a video on closet organizing, whatever it may be, a business or in your home, something that can help you. I would love if you watch that and give me some comments on it and leave some feedback. For me, that's the biggest support um, kind of an online community can bring. And where is the best place to find you to learn more about you and what you do? I know you said you have uh, Organized Jane. Yes. That's your website. Yeah, organizedjane.com. And there's um, on there is an About Me page, plus uh, my weekly blog posts go up and also my weekly YouTube videos. And from there, all my social channels, Instagram and YouTube are my most used. And um, I'm most active on those platforms. And do you also post, because I know you said that you do some speaking engagements um, and you have events sometimes that that you're involved with and whatnot and tours and those kind of things. Do you also post that online if people want to potentially see you in person? Yes, I do. And I'm coming up to a cross Canada tour in um, 2020, starting in Edmonton and going to um, all the provinces. It's a Women Empower Women event, but it's um, I'll be speaking all about organizing. And I post all of those um, on my website and also on my uh, Instagram feed. Okay, guys, listening out there. Yes, if you are not already following her, please, please go and on Instagram and Facebook, all the places, follow Jane because she does come out with really inspiring content. I can personally attest, (laughs) super big fan. And I love, love the fact that you could come on and share some of your wisdom with the audience today. Jane, I am grateful for your energy and your time and your passion for helping others. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, I was so honored to have you speak at my book launch and you did an amazing job and the women in the room were, we were all captivated. So I thank you as well from the bottom of my heart and thank you for having me today. Thanks so much for joining me. If there's anyone you know who you think could benefit from hearing today's episode, it would mean the world if you'd share it with them. Love what you heard? Then please subscribe. If you really love what you heard, then please leave a review with your honest and loving thoughts. This podcast wouldn't be possible without your support. If you feel called to, please make contributions to my podcast fund that helps me to keep it going strong, bringing on amazing guests for you, and to continue the ripple effect of spreading goodness in the world. I appreciate you, your time, and your energy, and I love hearing from you, so drop me a line on social media. As always, I'm wishing you a positive day and your own piece of paradise. 
Until next time, sending you love and light and keep shining.